with a very melodious recitation. Um, before we go forward, can I just ask you all to have a look at Kumail? Because Kumail, I think you look very handsome today. But I also think that Sakina might just have outdone you on this one. I'd now like to call upon someone who needs no introduction. Someone who can bless the suspicious day with his knowledge and wisdom. My elders, brothers and sisters, Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Panjou. Can I request you all to please move as far forward as possible with three loud salawats. سورة المباركة الفاتحة بسم الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله بارئ الخلائق الأجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد الله صل على محمد والصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذلومين لا سيما ولي الله الحجة ابن الحسن صاحب الأمر والزمان روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الأولين والآخرين إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة صدق الله العلي العظيم وآمنا به نور مجالسكم بذكر محمد وآل محمد The institution of marriage is one where the understanding depends as per the ideology to which a person is subscribed to. For understanding of marriage to a certain degree is contingent upon the ideology, the ideology to which that person subscribes to. Depending on his ideology, his outlook towards marriage, his method of conducting a marriage, the measures through which a successful marriage is gauged, everything depends upon the ideology that a person subscribes to. You will find that in the subcontinent, hundreds of years back, marriage was seen as an institution where the husband is getting a form of a property. You have someone in the house now who you own, who is under your control, who is there to do your chores for you and be a sort of a servant for you. This was an understanding of the marriage as for the culture and the ideology that dictated the day and therefore the ta'amul the way of living, the interaction between the husband and the wife was not that of two equal individuals. It was one of, you could say, an owner over a slave. 
Hasab, the ideology. And you find that even in medieval times within Europe, the understanding was that, that the woman was seen as a property that was owned by the man. The woman had very free rights until perhaps towards the Industrial Revolution. You find even in this day and age, as we progress in the age of technology and development, this idea of marriage, why should two individuals live together or get together to live a life together? You will find that there are a number of reasons that come about from that. Even during the time of Jahiliya, before we come to the age of technology, during Jahiliya, what was the purpose of marriage? It is absolutely important for us to ask this question. What is the purpose of marriage? Everything we do in our life has a purpose behind it, whether it is in the matters of the dunya or it is in the matter of the deen. Every aspect by way of example in furuwad deen, there is a reason and there is a goal which we are supposed to achieve through that action, which is why you will find that ulama of principles of jurisprudence will tell you that certain sort of ibadat are ibadat wusuliyah in that this ibadah is a wasila or a means towards achieving something greater. And you find that Sayyida Fatima al-Zahra salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayha Allahumma swalli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad this beloved daughter of the final messenger of Islam who was given the title Sayyidatin Nisa al Alameen, the master of the women in paradise. She shows us this within her sermon, the sermon known as the Khutbah Fadakiya. And she explains to us the philosophy behind a number of the acts that govern our religion. وَجَعَلَ اللَّهُ الْإِيمَانَ تَتْحِيرًا لَكُمْ مِنَ الشِّرْكِ وَجَعَلَ الصَّلَاةِ For example, تَنْزِيهًا عَنِ الْكِبْرِ وَالزَّكَاةِ تَزْكِيَةً لِلنَّفْسِ Why does a person pray? Five times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained us to uphold the salat. This act of worship, what is the goal behind this? The daughter of the Holy Prophet says that prayer as an action has been ordained upon us by the creator of the universe in order to free man from the shackles of arrogance. Ajib. The relationship between Salat and arrogance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator says, five times a day, you will put your head down as a form of submission towards me, and this should cultivate within you the character of humility to clean the heart from arrogance. You find today, majority of the global problems that we face at an economic level, at a political level, at a social level, the root cause of this is arrogance. Disputes between members of the community, disputes between members of a family, for example, many of the times they cannot be resolved because of a barrier, that barrier being arrogance. Friendships do not last, where one party is reluctant to apologize, of arrogance Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our creator out of his infinite wisdom stipulated upon us an action of worship and the symptom or the side effect the visible symptom of this prayer one of them is that man brings himself down to humility you prostrate on earth and you remind yourself that you were created from this earth you are going to return back to this earth one day. And every other creation is created from earth just like you. And hence there is no reason to show arrogance or pride towards any other creation of God. And therefore the prayer is a practical lesson which should clean our hearts from arrogance. And as a side point, 
if I want to know whether my prayer is accepted or not on a daily basis, I go back and I refer back to my soul. Do I possess within me the traits of arrogance or no? Then I get the answer whether my salat is kabul or no. For every action that we do within the religion has a goal behind it. Salat has a goal, prayer has a goal. A zakat, waja'alallahu zakat, waja'alallahu zakat, taskiyatan lin nafs. The Almighty Creator of the universe has stipulated upon us that we must pay dues to those in the community who are well off. The meaning over here of zakat is to spend in the way of God, sometimes by obligatory means, either khums or zakatul mal, and sometimes by charity, sadaqa, mustahab. Allah, the, our Creator, has ordained upon us that we need to give charity from our wealth. Janab, what is the reason, what is the goal behind this charity? Tazkiyah to nafs, to purify our soul, because man has got this instinct within him to be connected to his wealth, such that his entire identity revolves around the wealth that he owns. He is willing to commit the greatest crimes and trample upon every moral value in order to increase his wealth. This is something that is very, very subtly taught to us in our lessons of economics. You know, today is a lecture for marriage, but economics is an important part of marriage. But if you don't have a credit card, Habibi Kumail, get ready to apply for one. Economics, we are told that resources are scarce. And hence, you have this entire theory of demand and supply. Resources are scarce. That's why you need to do everything you can and use every means that you can in order to gain these resources. And hence, you find you have this global war towards ownership of resources because the mind perceives it to be scarce. God tells us no in this race to own and own and own and consume and consume and consume which then takes over your conscience and takes over your morality. Take a step back and give. Don't only Utilize yourself or be preoccupied with consumption for yourselves. No, take a step back, wish good for others. Purification of the soul, this trait of wanting good for other than the self, something you find that generally is becoming a trait which is extremely rare. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, give zakat, give charity. Purifies the soul, brings the human back, down to the level of insania, humanity. For you find that everything within the religion has a goal behind it. The goal behind prayer is to free the soul of arrogance. The goal behind charity is to induce within us these characters of humanity. And similarly marriage, because marriage is stipulated within Islam as one of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces the institution of marriage by saying, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa min ayatihi an khalaka lakum min anfusikum azwaja. Wa min ayatihi, and it is from amongst his signs. The words ayat means signs. And the pronoun ha, the dhamir ha, refers back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, when Allah is introducing the institution of marriage, he says it is from amongst the signs of the existence and the grandeur and the superiority of the Lord of the universe that he has created for you from amongst yourselves, spouses. Then what is the goal behind the marriage? You find... If you link this to our initial theme that the outlook towards marriage depends upon the ideology in which you subscribe to. Those that lived at medieval times and whose ideologies taught that the wife is a slave to the husband, they dealt with their 
or the husband is the slave to the wife. They dealt accordingly. And then you had those that says, no, the outlook of marriage, the goal of marriage is that this is a cost-effective way to get through life. I on my own cannot own a 300, 400,000 pound mortgage, so the best thing to do is find a partner who I can get married to, who has the capacity to earn, nesate sate bega bega haba na haba ujaza kibaba, together we'll be able to fulfill and buy a house. This is the goal of the marriage cost-effective way to get through the 21st century. In Islam law, Islam introduces marriage as a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is this goal and the purpose behind marriage? You find the answer, the best answer comes from Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamhu alayhi. When he was asked after his marriage to the daughter of the Holy Prophet, Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen, the Prophet asks him after some time, O oh Ali, how do you find marriage? He replies by saying, Ni'mal aun ala ta'atillah. Ajeeb. He says, my wife is the best support, pillar of support towards this journey of obedience towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from here we understand the meaning of the word sukoon. The goal of marriage, the measure of a successful marriage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a very eloquent manner captivated in one word within this verse, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا The goal of marriage is for the man and for the woman to feel this sukoon inside them, tamanina, stability, security, financial stability, financial security through understanding with the wife. Emotional security and stability is known as sukoon. Through this emotional and psychological stability and security, you are able to gain proximity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Islam is a religion is not confined to acts of worship such as Salat and Psalm only. No, Salat and Psalm is an important aspect of the religion, no doubt. But a big part of Islam is managing relationships with those around us. And hence you find Risalatul Hukuk of Imam al-Sajjad. What benefit is there in a Salat? Or what benefit is there in a person spending long hours in Salat when he doesn't have the basic etiquette of how to speak with somebody around him? What is the benefit of long hours of Salat when after this Salat the person does not have the right etiquette in with or with which he should speak with his wife or the wife should speak with the husband? Islam as a religion descended upon us to teach us how to be insan. A big part of the deen revolves around managing relationships with those who are around us, within the structure of a family and those that are outside. One time, Rasulullah was asked, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sallam. What is the right that a wife has over the husband? And it seems from the context of the hadith that the woman was extremely aggravated, the way we would say now, she was extremely vexed. 
and she had nowhere to go to. You know, you lived at a time where women had absolutely no right. The, the wife couldn't even threaten the husband and say that I'm going to complain to my father-in-law. So <laughs> this day and age is different. Sometimes you, the wife threatens the husband with the father-in-law. No. That time she was vexed. She went to the Rasulullah. She said, my only option is the messenger of God. Let me go and ask him what my right is. What rights do I have over my husband? And perhaps my husband may listen to this final messenger of God. She goes, she asks Rasulullah, what are my rights? What right do I have over the husband? Rasulullah says, in regards to the husband, Allah yuqabbih fi wajahiha. The right of the wife. This is not a favor that you do over the wife. It is her right given to her by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah says that the husband should not even frown in the face of his wife. Regardless of whether the mistake is from the side of the wife or not. Rasulullah says this is the right of the woman that when you she makes a mistake or there is a misunderstanding you do not even frown at her. How gentle is the religion of Islam where even frowning at a wife? Allah. If you are not allowed to frown at your wife when she makes a mistake then what about venting out anger at the workplace on the wife? times you find the husband comes home difficult time at work no doubt but say comes into the house Abu San Kam Tarira the whole world's difficulties he wants to vent out on the wife La. Rasulullah says the right of the wife is that you do not frown in her face and you find hadith like these are many men used to come to the time of Rasulullah and it seems that from the questions that this marital institution and the laws and the etiquettes that should govern a marriage were not understood by the people of the time. A person comes to Rasulullah once and he was from outside of Medina. He sits, he speaks with Rasulullah. Rasulullah asks him about his wife. The person replies to Rasulullah by saying, in regards to my wife, the way we conduct our affairs at home, is that every morning when I go back to the desert to tend to the livestock, when I'm leaving home in the morning, my wife walks me to the door and bids me farewell with a smile. When I come back home in the evening, having spent the entire day under the sun tending to my livestock as soon as I come home I find my wife is the first one standing at the door ready to welcome me with a bowl of water and a cloth to wipe my face when I come home upset or worried and the signs of sadness are on my face my wife approaches me and within this you find an important lesson that in order for a successful marriage much as communication is key verbal communication it is also important to be familiar and to be able to recognize non-verbal cues I do not have to wait for my spouse to say that she is upset or he is upset. I should be able to read nonverbal cues. So he says to Rasulullah that when she sees the signs of sadness or when she sees that I'm worried for my face, she comes to me straight away and she says to me, Habibi, my darling, what is it that worries you? Is it the affairs of the dunya 
Is it our livelihood? Is it our income? If it is our income that is uh, worrying you, do not worry about it. I am by your side. How much sukoon this gives to a man. When he knows regardless of whether there is a credit crunch or no, whether they will be able to make the mortgage payment for the house or no, whether they have to downsize or no, he has absolute conviction and satisfaction that his wife is going to be behind him. And she says to me, the conversation continues, my wife tells me that if you are worried about your akhira, about your afterlife, then my wife says to me, if you are worried about your akhira and you are worried about how you are going to meet your Lord, then may Allah increase your grief in this. Mu'mina. Think about the akhira. Sometimes a person needs encouragement, but encouragement from home. She's laying the foundation for a tarbiyah saliha. Do you know what Rasulullah's reply was to this person? For the wife that you have, not only are you guaranteed Jannah, but for your wife, she has the ajar of 70 shaheed every day until the day of judgment. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. This is the vision that Islam has given us. This is the structure that Islam has given us in the regards to the institution of marriage. Where life and the dunya becomes Jannah before the eternal Jannah is sought. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the sake of Ahlul Bayt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah encompass our brother Kumail and sister Sakina in eternal happiness in the dunya as well as the akhirah. Inshallah these pearls of wisdom and formulas of a happy marriage which the Holy Prophet and his infallible progeny have left behind for us. Insha'Allah, Allah give us the tawfiq to implement these in our lives, insha'Allah. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen yakulullah ta'ala fi kitabihi al-hakeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima.